Oh, blood, sweat and tears. Hardy, hi, hardy, ho. Back on 9.30 DCFM at 8.9. And it's time now, that time of the week, and he's got to listen to his little introduction, so here we go. Uh, one, two, three. It's time now for the latest news on what's hot and what's not in the world of technology with Matthew Dickerson on Tech Talk. <laughs> here on DCFM 88.9. Morning, Matthew. How are you? Morning. I was actually waiting for the Blues Brothers version of Heidi, so I thought that might have been the version you were going to roll out there. No, no, no. Um, now, uh, before we go any further, um, I mentioned it yesterday, 30 years for mobile phones in Dubbo, or yeah. cell phones, as um, the Americans call them. And I think there's the only country in the world now that still calls them cell phones. Most of the Yanks now are calling them mobile phones as well. Uh, but we're talking about the number 018636, and that was how it all started. So back in, on 26th of July 1990, I connected Dubbo's first mobile, and the, the mobile network was turned on that day. And the prefix allocated for Dubbo was 636. So the numbers were only nine digit then, not 10 digit. And so all mobile numbers started with 018. That was it. There was yep. no other choice there. And then your region got the next three digits. So Dubbo region had 636. So back in those days, you only had the choice of the last three if you got any choice at all. But that effectively meant that they had allocated only a thousand numbers for this region. And when you consider now there are more mobiles in use than there are people in Dubbo with say, 42,000 people, there's probably 45,000 mobiles being used here compared to then they're allocated a thousand numbers only. So yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. And I notice um, there are still a few people around who've got um, 0418 636 when they changed over to uh, the uh, 10 digit thing. Yeah. And uh, still a few phones rocking around like When you that. see one of those, ask that person and, and most of the time, they might have just randomly got the number somewhere, but most of the time they'll have had that number since they had the 018 equivalent. So yeah. they might have got the number back in the early 90s. So 1990, this was the analog network, the That's right. what's known as AMPS, Advanced Mobile Phone System was the network name. It was about 93 that the digital network, the GSM network, started to be introduced in this country. So most people were on AMPS, especially out here, because the reception went further. And it wasn't until 2001 that the AMPS network was turned off. So essentially, most people connecting that early to mid-90s were connected with the AMPS network, were connecting with the 018 series, and then obviously other carriers got introduced with other numbers as well. That's when I swapped over, I didn't care, and I uh, got my present number, which has got no 636 in it at all, but I do remember my first mobile number yeah. uh, for, oh no, 018 636. Two two seven. There you go. <laughs> I must have been the what two hundred and twenty seventh person to join up in Dubbo. You actually had some choice, some amount yeah. of choice, and I remember the, the first number that I connected was two six two with the last three digits. Right. So it was it was basically you could pick from a pool of available numbers. Yeah. All right, um, moving right along. Um, the UK have uh, doing all sorts of things with wind farms. Very interesting story. Offshore wind farms. Yeah. This is really interesting. There's a lot of offshore wind farms. There's one known as the, as the uh, I think it's the UK Array, 175 towers. That was went up about a year or two ago. But this particular wind farm, now the way it works with wind farms in the UK is that you put in a bid for how much you're going to charge per megawatt hour. And if that amount is higher than what you can generate with fossil fuel, the UK government has been subsidising those. And some people have complained about that because they've said that that will increase the price of electricity bills. And in the short term, people are right. But if you look at the long term picture, because the great thing about a wind farm is you put it in and then there's minimal maintenance. You don't have to keep feeding coal down its throat. And so the long term view is that it's much cheaper. But this particular wind farm proposed is the first one ever that they're saying that the amount that the, the subsidy, if you like, will be a negative subsidy. In other words, the amount proposed by this proponent is actually less than the cost of fossil fuel per megawatt hour. They're talking about 40 pounds per megawatt hour. And so this means that the actual person putting it in or the company putting it in will be paying the UK government for the production of electricity rather than taking a subsidy. So this is the first one that they've seen in the UK, probably the first one around Europe where you've, you've had a negative subsidy. So there are other ones around Germany, for example, where it's zero subsidy, but this is the first one that will start to pay money back. So that's a big breakthrough, I think, around the world where you start to look at now when farms cheaper to put in but go forward 10 20 years that wind farm will still be there still spinning away meanwhile the the coal-fired power station next door will still having coal shoveled down its throat yeah well let's hope the bearings last that long and the uh, 
in the wind power, but anyway. Well, they do talk about 25-year lifetime on them before they've got to do major maintenance. That doesn't mean 25 years and they pull it all down. 25 years and they'll have to probably do a gearbox in them, but they're well-maintained. They, they, they will grease and oil change every <laughs> two million revolutions or whatever it might be. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing like, a, no, nothing like having a, you, you service your wind power. Yeah. That's right. All right. Um, just staying on that, solar production and uh, how COVID-19 has helped solar production. This is an interesting one too. Yeah, and it, it makes sense. If you have less pollution in the air, you're going to get more sun, hit the solar panels, but how do you organise somewhere to have less pollution so we can actually test the hypothesis out? Well, you organise a worldwide pandemic, you stop lots of fossil fuel production around the world, and suddenly in Delhi, for example, they found that the solar production from the solar panels installed across Delhi have gone up by 8%. Now, I would expect in our region we would see no change because we've already got pretty clean air out here, and I don't think COVID-19 has really affected the air pollution we've got out here. But in places like Delhi, you can imagine in places like Beijing, in places like New York, LA, London, I'm sure there are already studies out that show how much less air pollution. But what's really good about this is we have less air pollution, therefore we produce more solar, more electricity from solar. And if you're producing more electricity from solar, you need less fossil fuel electricity production because you've got more solar. So it's this spiral, this positive spiral, where you're getting more solar because you've got less pollution and it goes on in a positive manner. So that's a really great sign, but 8% is the number they're allocating to it. Well, um, I think that's great. And I'm just thinking, uh, uh, you mentioned Beijing. What about Shanghai? Shanghai, a um, number of times I've been there. You can't, on the big bridge in Shanghai, um, you can't see from one end to the other. It's well, so smoky. I remember on one of those sister city trips that we've been on yeah. there, it was in Beijing and, and the motel, uh, after I'd been in our sister city, um, Wuzhang, for a little while, we went to Beijing and uh, one day when I came out, the reception said to me, oh, Mr. Dickerson, it's it's a very cloudy day today. And I looked out and I looked back and I said, how can you tell? It looks the same to me as it did yesterday <laughs> because I couldn't tell the difference between smog yeah. and cloud. They all look the same to me. Yeah, been in Beijing one day where they had a northerly Read, read southerly for um, for Australia, uh, had a northerly wind up there and had blown all the smoke away and you could actually see the Great Wall. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so yeah. it was good. Very unusual. Yeah, yeah very unusual. <laughs> now, um, what's this about batteries and changing batteries? We seem to be changing batteries in this joint like it's going out of style. Um, um, so I'm looking for anything that's going to make batteries last a little bit longer. Yeah, well, Qualcomm have come up with a, a new charging process, if you like, and, and Qualcomm often set the standard with batteries where you can do a 50% charge in five minutes, uh, a full charge in 15 minutes. And that kind of doesn't make sense because if you can go halfway in five minutes, surely you can go all the way in 10 minutes. Yeah. But what happens with any battery, whether it be on your phone or your cameras or your car, whatever that battery is, typically what they'll do is they'll charge fast in the beginning and as it gets closer to full charge, it slows mm -hmm. down. That's to protect the battery, make sure you don't get fires, explosions, that type of thing. So a 50% charge in five minutes is a big breakthrough. And what you'll see from this is we won't see phones, for example, out tomorrow that do 50% charge in five minutes. But now that this standard has been effectively introduced by Qualcomm, you'll start to see manufacturers manufacture to this standard. And maybe not this year's phones, but probably next year's phones, you'll see that fast charging getting to that point where you are getting that 50% charge in five minutes. And so getting those faster charges, and it's great for your phone, yeah. and then it starts to translate to other devices that need more power, like a car, where you can charge them up quicker in a shorter period of time. And, and obviously that's the holy grail to get those devices that have got convenient battery carriage yeah. or, or having that charge in their battery, but getting it charged up quickly as well. I think it's great. Yeah, mm. good. And uh, that'll obviously flow into other areas as well. And is... that's right. And Qualcomm is one of the organisations that's working hard on, on trying to, to keep breaking down that potential there of faster charging without any danger being introduced. But, but that's pretty good. 50% charge in five minutes is not too bad from yeah. a battery perspective. Almost, um, we're a bit over time, it's almost 20 to 10, but I, I do want to do this story because you told me about the Blanshire uh, wanting to launch airships into, uh, into space, yep. and I discovered this morning, uh, just to throw a spanner in the works, that Abbott Point, which is near Bowen in Queensland, have also said that they want to become a place to uh, launch rockets. So it looks like we've got the Blanshire in New South Wales, which is where... 
uh, or Bland down near West Wylong oh, way. Okay. And uh, I, I love what Bland did a little while ago. I remember it was probably a couple of years ago now. They went on a marketing campaign where they found a town called Dull and they found a place called Boring. One was in Scotland, one was in the US. And they put together a little marketing campaign of go and visit Bland, Dull and Boring. Yeah. And I thought that was very clever. Take advantage of the fact that you've got a name that sounds very bland. And so what they're doing now is they're looking for other opportunities. And there's a, a space organisation called Thunderstruck and they put balloons up into the strat or well, I think it's the, the lower stratosphere, about 23 kilometres above the Earth. And those balloons are used for monitoring. For example, they might monitor illegal fishing. They might monitor border patrol. They're up there basically spying on us, if mm. you like, or, or monitoring what's going on. What they need is somewhere to launch from that's a fairly flat, open terrain, not a build-up area, not a forest-type area, because the balloon goes up, and a few weeks later, it comes back down. So they need to make sure they've got somewhere they can land that balloon. And the landing is not entirely accurate. They, they can't land to the millimetre. So they need to have somewhere that's fairly open and, and uh, able to be landed somewhere in a, in a various place or various places. So Bland was chosen as somewhere they thought they could do that. There's enough infrastructure for them to actually be able to, to, to get the balloons up in there in the first place. Not a lot of employment out of this, but I think, again, it's pretty clever marketing from Bland in that they'll be talking about space, here we are in Bland and we're launching balloons into space from somewhere where, again, it's something that's got a, a Bland name. So let's see what we can do to, to jazz it up a little bit. Well, it looks like they've got a bit of uh, competition from Abbott Point in the Whit Sundays, according to the mayor up there. Um, he said, um, and the state development minister, Kate Jones, if the proposal was successful, quote, um, jobs in Queensland's space industry could triple. I mean, well, what are they now? There's it, two of them now. Yeah, I was going to say, there'd be six. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we think alike. Uh, Matt, it's always good to talk to you with Tech Talk. Uh, great stories this week. We'll see you next Wednesday. Uh, thanks, Richard. And we'll see what, who, who uh, wins that race between Bland and the, whatever shire the name was <laughs> in, at Abbott Point in Queensland near Bowen. I think it's the Bowen Shire Council. DCFM 88.9. It's 18 to 10. Here's Art Garfunkel this morning. He's got some bright eyes. And it's still foggy outside, as a matter of fact. So uh, take it easy on the roads.